Good afternoon, uh, good evening, and good morning, depending on where you're listening from. We're about to start the presentation now. Uh, my name is Peggy Bishop Lane. I'm the Vice Dean of the Wharton MBA Program for Executives. And today we're gonna to be talking about the classroom experience through the faculty lens. I'm joined today by Professor Patty Williams, the Ira Lippman Associate Professor of Marketing. Patty's research in marketing is centered around emotions and how that affects marketing and decision making. She teaches strategic brand management at Wharton to executive MBA students, full-time MBA students and undergraduates. And in the past, she's also taught advertising and our core marketing management class. Good afternoon, Patty. Hey, Peggy, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, before we get started, I want to say a little bit about the program for those who are uh, just now starting to investigate the MBA program for executives. We are a 24-month uh, MBA program. Our degree is the same degree as our full-time MBA program at Wharton. It's just how we offer it that differs. Uh, we offer it every other weekend for students. They fly in or drive in or train in, depending on where they live on Friday mornings. Class goes all day Friday. We stay in one or two hotels near campus. We have class on Saturday through 4 p.m. And then people are home by Saturday evening to be with their friends and family. The class structure looks a lot like our MBA program. The curriculum is identical, but you're with a different group of people in that our work experience requirement is a minimum of eight years, going all the way up to 20 or more years of experience. Um, we'll be talking a lot about that classroom experience and the folks in the classroom this afternoon. I do also want to remind everybody that if you have a question, please enter that question in the chat box. We're also joined today by one of my colleagues on the admissions committee, Taylor Hotsko. Hi, Taylor. Hi, Peggy. She's gonna be monitoring the chat box and letting us know when your questions pop up so that we can answer them for you. So let's get started, Patty. Um, I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and um, we can share our experiences in the classroom. Um, why don't you tell the folks a little bit more about what you teach and how long you've been teaching at Wharton and Wemba in particular? Sure. Um, so as Peggy mentioned, I'm a marketing professor. I've actually been at Wharton almost 20 years, um, which is amazing. Um, and I uh, have been teaching in Wimba um, probably for about 13 years of that time. Um, as Peggy mentioned, I taught the MBA core for a number of years. Um, at Wharton, we have two Wharton uh, core classes, two marketing core classes, and I've taught both of those, both to our full-time students and to the Wemba students, both in Philadelphia and in San Francisco. Um, and about three years ago, I moved to an elective that's about uh, branding. Um, and I taught that last year to both the Philadelphia and the San Francisco Wemba students and doing that again this year. That's great. Um, Patty, do you find that, that the brand class, um, you're able to bring in a lot of your research or your other experiences into the classroom? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, um, Peggy mentioned my research is around the role of emotions um, in decision making. You can imagine that branding in particular is a place where emotions uh, play an important role. Um, the kinds of emotional connections that consumers might feel to brands, the kinds of emotions that brands are trying to build into their platforms um, as they think about how to build relationships with consumers. So definitely, um, I would also say I work with a lot of organizations, um, companies um, around branding. Um, um, I do some consulting around branding. So this is something I, I really love. Um, it's a class I've wanted to teach for a long time. And I love being able to bring in and make that connection between the academic research that's relevant. And it's also a very practical course, very practically minded about what does brand management look like in the real world. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, so you mentioned that you teach uh, MBAs, full-time MBAs, and undergraduates at Wharton as well. Um, what do you see as the differences between those classrooms and the executive MBA classroom? 
Yeah, great question. Um, and I'll throw that back to you in a few minutes as well, <laughs> let you answer that. Um, I think, so first of all, um, the undergrads are delightful at Penn um, and Wharton, as you can imagine, smart as a whip, um, very diligent and conscientious. The, you know, the thing about teaching them is they don't have really any business experience, right, um, right. for the most part. Um, so they've done all their homework and they, you know, couldn't be more prepared than they are when they walk into class. But they're really um, learning this in order to guide their future work efforts as opposed to their their current work efforts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the MBA students, full time MBA students obviously come in with work experience. Um, but it's, you know, typically around five or six years. Um, it's meaningful work experience, but they're a little junior compared to what our um, Wemba students typically have had. Mm -hmm. um, and again, a lot of this work is fairly theoretical for them in that, you know, they might have done something relevant in the past and they're looking toward doing something relevant in the future, but they're not currently working on these kinds of issues. Um, so there are great conversations to be had around the real world um, that their practical experience enables but it's still a little bit um, removed from their present uh, circumstances. Yeah. What I love about teaching Wemba's is that they're deeply invested in these issues, um, both from a learning perspective, right? They, um, th these are learners at the highest level, deeply curious, deeply engaged with the content. They're there because they really want to be, um, right. but they're also really trying to think about how the content you're presenting at any given moment relates back to their own work experience and the own problems that they're facing um, or opportunities they're facing in their own organizations. So it's quickly grounded in their real day-to-day -day experience, yeah. um, which is fabulous. I love that opportunity. Yeah, I agree. How about you? Yeah, so um, so I, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm an accounting professor for those who are joining a little bit later. In addition to being the vice dean of the program, the class I teach is a core class. So in fact, it's the, it's the very first class people take. It's an intro to financial and managerial accounting. Um, and so I have the same experience basically that you just described, um, that the executive MBA classroom, they just, they know why they're there more so than certainly the undergrads and, and the MBAs. Um, they know what they know and they know what they don't know. And they know why they need to know um, this new material. So, you know, even for people who don't have any financial or accounting background, they understand why they need to learn it, even if they, even if it wouldn't have been their choice to do so, um, because they know they have to say, learn how to talk about a, a PL statement or something like that, or understand what cost cutting means. So I think, like you said, it's really top of mind for them. Um, when, when people ask me this question, what's the difference between teaching MBAs and executive MBAs, I say it's, it's in a, a large way, it's about the discussion in the classroom. And it's not because MBAs can't have a discussion about their work experience because they have, you know, pretty good work experience coming in. It's just that they're not in the middle of it at the time. And so the fact that the executive MBAs are doing both at the same time, it really makes that discussion in the classroom um, ultra focused and interesting um, for everybody in the room. The other thing I would add is um, for most of them, I don't think they're as focused on grades. I think that's probably especially true relative to an undergraduate classroom. Uh, obviously some are, um, but not everybody is in the same way. They're, they're they're much more focused on the actual learning, and hopefully that translates to a good grade, right? But um, but they're not as intent on that, I would say. I agree. Yeah, yeah. So um, in your teaching experience, you were in the Wemba classroom for a while, and then you stepped away for a few years and came back. Um, when you came back uh, a couple of years ago, did you notice any differences in the classroom? Yeah, good question. Um, so I would say I've noticed a few differences. Um, the One of the things I would say, first of all, I think there are more women in Wemba um, than there have been historically, which is amazing. And I think that's, um, you know, consistent with our recruiting objectives and, and with overall trends in, you know, graduate level education. Um, and probably a deeper emphasis on, you know, development opportunities for professional women. Um, but that's palpable in the classroom. 
um, and is a is a great uh, a great thing to see. Um, you know, I don't. I think there are the the there are probably some smaller companies represented in the classroom um, than there might have been before. Um, you know, there's just a trend towards entrepreneurship and a lot of startups, and you see some of that represented in the mm -hmm. Wimba classroom as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, I continue to 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 love, I love seeing things like um, people who are full time in the military, for example, or people who are full time doctors. Those are just really interesting and non traditional students for us to see at Wharton, and those are those are great um, uh, experiences to to add into the Wimba classroom. I agree. The the only the trend that I've noticed in class over time. Um, both as a teacher and as the vice dean, is a lot more people from healthcare too are, mm -hmm. are joining the program. And I think that's understandable, you know, given the healthcare industry um, and the fact that we have more industries represented, I think, every year. Like you said, small companies, but also really different kind of industries as well. And, and that's one of the ways. Uh, I think that we try to get diversity in the classroom. So it's not just about women or underrepresented minorities. It's about different industries being represented. Yeah, I agree with that. There's a lot of that diversity and, you know, a diversity of backgrounds in terms of what people have done in their in their past as well, yeah. um, professionally. Um, yeah. And the other thing I would say is I think there are more and more babies being born um, <laughs> <laughs> um, while students are in the program. Um, and that, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, it's one of the fun things at graduation is always to hear, you know, how many babies were born to the <laughs> students in the program, um, both the women in the program and for the men in the program. And it's it's oddly almost like a competition across the years. So um, and I got to tell you, that's really amazing that students can handle all of that while going to school and uh, working full time. They They are absolute troopers in that respect. So, um, we both teach on both coasts in Philadelphia and in San Francisco. Um, I wonder if you want to say a little bit about whether those are different experiences for you or how they're different, how they're similar. Yeah, great question. So, um, you know, first of all, they're they're very similar in that it, they're I teach the same material to both coasts, um, and uh, both classrooms are filled with um, you know really eager um, and outstanding students. There are some differences in industry, as you would expect, I think, um, and it won't surprise anybody who's listening. We're more likely to see more tech companies on the West Coast, and you know more. Um, sort of traditional companies, maybe on the on the East Coast a little bit. Um, so related to that, there might be a few more engineers uh, on the West Coast, um, you know, regardless of what company they're coming from. So I think those those differences are typically true. Um, you know, there are some cultural differences, East Coast, West Coast. I think the West Coast is a is a little more relaxed maybe than the East Coast is <laughs> as a as a general tendency. Um, and I have to say, I think of the West Coast as home, even though I live in Philadelphia. So I'm always extra happy to be out there teaching in that beautiful facility. Um, yeah, that's great. How about you? Yeah, uh, I agree that the overall industry um, concentration is as one would expect, you know, a little bit more tech on the West Coast, a little bit more finance, government on the East Coast because we're so close to Washington, D.C. But I like to tell people that doesn't mean there isn't tech on the East Coast and there isn't finance and government on the West Coast. So uh, it's just that the preponderance of people um, kind of as you would expect, right? That's where those industries are. Um, the casualness is funny. Um, what I've noticed too is that, yeah, definitely more casual on the West Coast, but I think because they're so much more casual in their general day-to-day -day lives that when students come to campus on the West Coast, they tend to dress up more. Um, on the East Coast, they tend to dress down more. So they they take on that opposite persona of what they do um, in their workday. And that's, that's kind of fun to see, actually. Yeah. Um, the entrepreneurship angle is also really interesting. I'd say certainly entrepreneurship as a goal is probably, there's probably more people on the West Coast with that in mind. And probably um, just 
undertaking it or thinking about it is almost second nature to a lot of people there. Um, but on the other hand, on the East Coast, when students do get that entrepreneurial bug, they really go at it with a vengeance. It's not as casual. Um, they, they take it really seriously. And as a result, we've seen some great successes on the East Coast entrepreneurially as well as on the West Coast. So that's, that was an interesting uh, thing to, to witness over the last few years. <clears throat> Yeah, and the only other thing I might add to that is I think there is a general movement at Wharton towards more entrepreneurship. Um, yeah. you know, obviously, lots of resources being committed at the at the overall school level towards um, nurturing and fostering these kinds of goals. Um, I see that uh, across all the programs, undergraduate, full time MBA, and WEMBA. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you're right that you know the the San Francisco students, even if they're not currently launching a venture, they often have a side hustle in addition to their full job. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, where they're trying to think about what it means to to launch their own business. So it just is, it's just part of the air out yep. there in a different way. Yeah, agree, agree. So when you think about teaching in the executive MBA classroom, um, what's your favorite thing about doing it? Yeah, really good question. Um, I mean, so I think some of it is what I already mentioned. I love being able to teach and seeing that content not only you know sort of be embraced by eager uh, learners in the classroom but just immediately turned into action um, the opportunity for what i teach to get put into practice right away and you know it's not uncommon the students um you know will come up at a break and ask a question i'm trying to do this for my company do you have advice about this and you know in between class sessions they'll often send you an email um, I ran into this particular issue, or um, could I meet you next time I have class to ask some additional questions? And so there is this opportunity to influence um, the students in their professional lives very, very immediately and to influence their organizations really immediately. Um, and yeah. that kind of opportunity, I think, is just amazing. Yeah, I agree. Um, I, I probably see it in a different way, being a core class and right at the beginning of the program. but. I really love it when somebody will come up to me after class or during a break in class and say, hey, you know that topic we talked about last week? Well, uh, I was in a meeting uh, this week at work and they were talking about it and I actually understood what they were saying. <laughs> so like, oh, that's fantastic. It's great to see that this is really impacting you literally in the first month of the program. Yeah. Or, you know, my CFO came and, and asked me a question and I was able to relate something to what we did in class. Those things are really rewarding for me. Um, and obviously it kind of shows the students right away that there's an immediate ROI on what they're doing with our program. Um, the, the other thing that I really love is when I learn something from the students. So they'll be able to take a general concept that I'm talking about or applying to a particular industry. And then in class discussion, they'll bring up how it works in their industry, which I may not have known about. And it helps me um, in terms of my future teaching and understanding of the topic and kind of illustrates to the rest of the students that this can be so broadly applied to them. I agree with that. I will also say, you know, one of the things I really love about teaching the Wembas um, is that I've, I've managed to, you know, build relationships with a large number of students who continue to stay in touch with me over time, you know, mm -hmm. through emails, through, um, you know, we uh, some of them I've seen when I've been out teaching in San Francisco, for example. Um, it's a it's a different kind of professor to student connection because they are older, they're more adult. If we're closer to 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 peers in many ways, in the ways we're able to interact with one another. And I think that's exactly what you're suggesting, right? There is this different kind of give and take in that environment that is really rewarding personally, and I think builds long-term connections. Yep, totally agree. So do you have a favorite classroom story that you would share with everybody? Um, gosh, I might have to think a little bit about that one. Um, can I cold call you? Do you have a favorite classroom yeah. story, Peggy? <laughs> I'll give you time to think. <laughs> um, so I have a couple, actually. I'll, the one that I love the most, it actually goes back quite a few years, but I was uh, talking about a case in class 
So yeah, we actually have cases in accounting class. And um, it was really a kind of a standard thing where you, you know, firm has a decision to make uh, an accounting choice. Do they count for something, you know, one way or the other way? And we, we talked pretty standardly about how it would affect the profitability of the firm. Um, and in this case, it was about a bank. And everybody kind of nodded about, you know, how it would affect the profitability. And then there was a student in the back row um, who wasn't usually very vocal. This student worked for an NGO um, and around community banking. So the student raised his hand and said, um, you know, that's, that's great, but I just want to share with everybody how these decisions also affect the people who are the borrowers and the lenders on some on, on type this type of transaction. And so he shared with us the human side of these decisions, and it was really eye-opening for everyone. Um, just kind of reminded us that there was something else besides uh, profitability that came out of these types of decisions. So I just like that story a lot. And it also goes to show that you know, in accounting class, you don't have to be really financially adept to make very helpful and insightful comments. Um, so I try to bring that out of people when I can. Did yeah. that give you enough time? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I have a, a specific, you know, story, but I will say one of the, some of the things that I really appreciate um, in the class I'm teaching now, so it's about strategic brand management, and that is brands mostly in for-profit organizations, though we can certainly apply it to nonprofits and even to, you know, sort of personal brands. So sometimes people will talk about the brands uh, that, you know, say Beyonce has, right, a an amazing brand builder um, and powerful brand that she's built. But one of the things we do in class also is think about how to apply the frameworks around what makes for a strong and powerful brand um, to uh, the students' personal brands. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that that um, it's, a, it's a really powerful exercise for the students who choose to, to really make it so. Um, there's a lot of introspection. They get to collect some data about how they're perceived by other people. They get to really think about you know, which parts of their brand do they want to improve, which parts of their brand represent opportunities for them. Um, and really just interesting, um, one of the things I have them do, I write, they write a personal positioning statement, and those are often just really um, powerful, the things that they write about themselves. Um, and then they, I make them write a, a shorter version, a six word story, a personal story. Those stories are amazing. Um, yeah. We share them with the entire class at the end, and people are both incredibly um, adept at coming up with a six word story that has power, um, and the stories themselves are really um, amazing narratives. And I, I will say related to that, I'm working with a group of students now who are thinking about um, you know, what it means to be a woman working in tech and, and how do you build a personal brand in a professional setting that helps you have um, you know, the kind of opportunities that you'd like to have as a woman in, a, in an environment where there might be relatively few. So I think those kinds of interactions are really the, the kinds of stories I love best. Yeah, I agree. That's wonderful. So um, I want to remind everybody that um, we, we do have the ability for you to ask questions through the chat room. Taylor is taking those questions now. And um, Taylor, do you have any questions you'd like to let Patty and I know about and we can give us give a shot at answering them? Yes, I do have a few for you. The first one being, how do students engage with professors when they are not on campus or in class? Patty, you want to talk about that? You did mention um, that a little bit earlier. Want to expand? Yeah. Um, well, so I would say it, it, there are multiple kinds of interactions. So sometimes it's around, I'd like to follow up around something that you we talked about in class, which might be, you know, if you were um, here uh, at, at, in Philadelphia, it might look like office hours. Mm -hmm. um, and we can do that in a handful of ways. One, we can do a virtual meeting like this. Um, and I've often interacted with students by Skype or Zoom. Um, or you know Google Hangout, whatever it might be, and we can do that individually. We can do that with Teams. Sometimes it's just a phone call, mm -hmm. um, and that works uh, easily as well. Um, you know, I think from the faculty perspective, there's no um, constraints about the ways we want to interact with students. And I would also say we tend not to have you know sort of strict office hours like these are the only times we're going to do these kinds of interactions. It's a much more um, sort of uh, as needed. 
kind of an interaction. And so I think those things continue to happen both during the quarter um, and later. Um, and I will say when I've been working with teams, it's not uncommon to have the whole team sort of interact with me around a survey they might be putting together or uh, when I used to teach the simulation around their simulation results and how to interpret some of those things. Yeah. So it can it's something that's done quite easily and flexibly. Yeah, I, I have that same experience. I'll also add a couple of non-academic ways that students engage with faculty. Um, you know, faculty typically eat lunch with all of the students during the day, whether they're teaching in the morning or the afternoon. Um, it's pretty common to have faculty sit down with students at lunch, um, occasionally dinner, and especially in San Francisco because we do fly all of our faculty or the vast, vast majority of them out from Philadelphia to San Francisco. So we're kind of a captive audience when we're there. We're, we're not going home. Uh, so I'll find more faculty will eat dinner with students as well. And then um, at the hotel where everyone stays on Friday evenings, there's what we call the Wharton Pub, which is like a, a mirror of what happens here in Philadelphia with our full-time MBA students. And I'll find that faculty will go to Wharton Pub on Friday nights uh, with students as well. And then we advise them not to go out with students after that. But <laughs> but it is fun to, to see students um, more casually like that, too. I agree. I would never go to the full-time MBA pub, but I have been many times to the Wemba pub. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for sharing. The next question is, how's the teaching style in respect of splits between business cases, lecture, independent studying, et cetera, in our program? So I'll take that just from my vice dean overall perspective. Um, I, I think it's highly variable, right? So some faculty would be strictly lecture um, with questions. Um, I would say most of us probably have some mix of the two. Again, that depends on your subject matter, but you might do some lecture, some case. Um, in your more quantitative classes, you're probably doing problems together in class. Um, and then, Patty, you mentioned simulation. More and more, I think, faculty are introducing simulations into the classroom, which is another way of getting that kind of interaction and dealing with real data while you're doing it. Am I missing anything, Patty? No, I think that's right. And, you know, I think one of the things that um, is true of Wharton as an institution, right, there's no uh, overarching approach that the school has decided is the best approach. It's really um, left up to individual faculty members and what they think works best for the content that they're required to teach. So uh, you won't find it consistent across all of the faculty, um, probably even across all of the faculty in the same discipline, people are gonna approach these things um, according to their own preferences and what they think works best. Yeah, good point. good point. Anything else, Taylor? Yes, the last question is, how does the WEMBA program foster collaboration amongst their cohorts across their two campuses? Um, and also within the classroom, if it's a more of a competitive environment or a collaborative environment, mm -hmm. and would you be able to share any specific examples? So I'll talk about the program overall. Um, Patty, you can maybe share your experience in, in your different classrooms, but um, I see very little competition. Um, again, as I said earlier, what's great is if students are focused on learning and so there isn't the grade competition that you you might have experienced in your undergraduate program. Um, we just don't see that. Uh, we, we like to foster collaboration. In fact, we put everybody in a learning team at the very beginning of the program. So that signals a real team approach to learning. The team, they, they help each other on, uh, throughout the first year of the program. So pretty much going through that core curriculum together. Um, they help each other, whether it's somebody who has an expertise in an area and kind of helps the others in their group to learn it, or if somebody in the group is having a difficult time, maybe they are changing jobs or moving or having a, a baby, as we said earlier, um, the other members of the team would try to help them by picking up um, the slack a little bit for them, knowing that if at some point in the future that they might you know, give them that, that same respect and, and help later in the term. So 
I think that's really a, a big part of the collaboration. And in terms of cross coast, we've made a real concerted effort over the last five or so years to make sure that our coasts feel like they're one program. So we start everybody in Philadelphia, making sure that the San Francisco cohort feels part of the whole of Wharton and the University of Pennsylvania by being here in Philly. And then later at the end of the first year, we bring our Philadelphia cohort out to San Francisco um, so that they can see that beautiful campus and space and how it's different. And when we do these things, we try as best we can to mix the cohorts together. In fact, in the, in the uh, experience at the end in San Francisco, it's the second of the two marketing core courses, Patty, that I think you used to teach, yep. where they do the Saber simulation. And in that, we again put them in teams, but we mix the teams up with Philadelphia and San Francisco students. So they really have a reason to engage with each other. And I think that has really helped. And then finally, their last uh, joint experience is in September of the second year, we, we do a global course where again, we mix students in around four different global locations to study a topic that's particularly interesting in those locations. And so they, again, really get to mix because not only are they taking a class together, but just traveling together really is a bonding experience for everybody. Do you want to say something about in the classroom collaboration? And maybe the only other thing I would add, Peggy, is I've noticed increasingly students who take one semester and go to the other um, other campus. So it, it's not a huge number of people, but I've definitely had people in Philadelphia who are normally San Francisco students um, and vice versa. So there is an opportunity for those kinds of things as well um, for students who, you know, whose personal and professional lives can make that make that work. Um, right. I have never found the Wemba environment um, competitive. Um, I think that said, there's a there's a high level of excellence. Um, everybody is there to be there. Um, but it's not a competitive environment at all. Um, I actually think that's true even for our MBA program. Um, mm -hmm. The difference with the Wemba program is that one, it's smaller than the MBA program and there are deep bonds that I think, as you mentioned, that you've gone out of your way to create. People feel really connected with one another and there's a real sense of community. So yeah. um, you can imagine that, you know, it's still, it's still a complex human system. Not everybody loves everybody, right? But there <laughs> is sense of community and community mindedness, what it means to be a good community member. Um, and I think, you know, people naturally kind of sort themselves into kind of how much they care about the work in any particular class, right? Are they there to be the A student or are they there to be the B plus student? And that's okay, right? Because they're, as you said, they're less grade focused. Mm -hmm. um, and as a result, I don't think they're all trying to outdo one another. That's true in discussions. I think that's also true on assignments and overall performance in the class. Yeah. Um, performance is high, but people aren't trying to outmaneuver one another. Right, totally agree.